Well, good morning, church. I want to thank you so much for inviting me into your living room once again this week uh, to work through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, obviously, we're not gathering together as a church family once again, but we still do desire to do a sermon. Uh, so I'm here once again at the church uh, preaching to empty chairs. Uh, I do have my sister-in-law, Jessie, here who is putting together the recording, so you can thank her for doing that. Uh, but we do desire to put a sermon together, so uh, we pray that you will have opportunity to watch this and uh, learn and grow and be challenged and, uh, and convicted um, and even encouraged during these days. Now, church, I want to remind us here, although this may feel a little bit nice, uh, you're watching the sermon probably in your jammies, uh, you have the pause button readily available in case Pastor Derek gets uh, a little wild, and you even can control the temperature of your living room, I want to strongly encourage you, please don't get used to this. Uh, we don't plan on doing this forever. This is for a short time. We hope to be gathering again sooner rather than later, Lord willing. And I just want us to think for a moment how wonderful it's going to be uh, when uh, we are able to gather together again as church family. Now, now before we get into our text today, I do have just a few brief announcements uh, that I'd like to make known to you. Uh, the first one is this. We tried to send out a, a bulletin over email uh, along with some discussion questions for you to use as you see fit. Maybe you want to discuss some of the sermon right after you listen to it. Maybe you want to discuss it uh, around the dinner table as a family. Maybe you want to use some of these the questions uh, for personal reflection. That's really up to you. Uh, we pray that you get the bulletin that we send out. If you don't get it, it. That means we didn't have your email, so just contact me or my wife and we will get you on the list. The second thing is I want to make us aware that uh, during these days it's, it's challenging to be able to communicate with everybody. Uh, so the ways we will be communicating uh, are through the church Facebook page, uh, the church prayer chain, the, the bulletin we're sending out over email, and then maybe a little bit of communication when we put together these sermons. I want to remind us as well that during these days, uh, that are certainly strange. Let us not neglect to be thinking about one another. This is a great time for us to be the body of Christ. So uh, check in on your neighbors. Check in on people as God brings them to your mind. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we're loving one another well. Uh, Next, I want to remind us, if, uh, if you do have a need, and you'll find this in the bulletin that we send out, uh, if you have any kind of need or, or prayer request, uh, make sure to contact one of the elders, uh, one of the deacons, or even myself. We want to be here for you during these times. And then, and then lastly... Because, uh, because all church gatherings uh, have been canceled for the time being, I do want to remind you, we're kind of taking this on a week-to-week -week basis. Who knows what the Lord is going to do this next week? Uh, but, uh, but for the time being, uh, we, can, uh, we can expect church gatherings to be canceled until you hear of something different. So let's use technology to stay connected. Uh, we still have our phones, so we can give somebody a call uh, to provide a word of encouragement or pray with somebody. We can send an email. We can send a note. Uh, let's spend time, maybe even after the sermon, praying for our governing authorities. I want to read for us from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The Bible commands us to be praying for those uh, who are uh, in charge uh, over, uh, over countries and nations and cities. Listen to what it says. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. So let's take uh, the opportunity uh, that God gives us to, uh, to pray, uh, to remember those who are put in uh, those high places, those governing authorities. Let's also do our part in submitting to their recommendations. I want to remind us uh, that, that what we are experiencing now is, is not persecution. Uh, if, if the governing authorities were to come in and tell us, we don't like your message, you cannot get 
gather anymore, we would be having a different conversation because we would not forsake the gathering uh, because somebody disagrees with our message. Uh, what we have, uh, what we are experiencing today, though, is a, a public health issue where governing authorities who've been put in place by God have recommended that we uh, that we cancel or postpone gatherings. So, according to Romans chapter 13, we want to obey God first and foremost by submitting to those governing authorities that God has put into place. And you can read that for yourself, Romans 13, 1 to 2. So let's continue as we press on during these days to be diligent, to cultivate a heart for the Lord. If all we are doing is sitting on the couch watching CNN or Fox News, we are not going to be dis- encouraged at all. Let's be, uh, let's be diligent to spend time in the Word, to spend time in prayer, to spend time engaging in acts of love and kindness towards our neighbor. And I also want to mention this because this is something that's missing uh, as we are unable to gather. Uh, Don't neglect singing. I think singing is something that's really important. Now, obviously, there's nothing that can replace the the gathering where we get together and we as the body of Christ get to sing. But but I I want to encourage you not to neglect it even during these days. So, uh, So use the opportunity that God has given you this day to worship in your home to sing to the Lord. Uh, for, for my family, we, we may use some simple songs. We'll sing the doxology together. We may sing, I love you, Lord. We may sing, his mercy is more, more or how great thou art. Uh, I want to encourage you to kind of press through the awkwardness uh, and sing to the Lord. It's a command that's given us, uh, given to us in the scriptures. It's not something that we want to neglect. Now, with all that said, I want to get into our text for this week. So hopefully you have your Bible in front of you. Uh, we are going to continue to plug away in the Gospel of Matthew. So turn to Matthew chapter 27. Today we're going to look at verses 24 through 31. Matthew 27, 24 through 31. So as we continue to read of uh, the sufferings that Jesus endured at Calvary, I think what we're reminded of today is ultimately that the gospel uh, works. The gospel is effective. It, it does as God intended it to do. What we're going to remember today ultimately as we work through this text is that the gospel is not like God is kind of throwing up some kind of half-court heave, hoping that it goes in, hoping that it works, hoping that it does something. The gospel works. The gospel, when applied to the life of of an individual, as an individual puts faith in Christ, the person and work of Christ, the gospel is effective. So so church, many of you know that uh, Sarah and I, we are the parents of five children. We have five children, all under the age of 10. Uh, See if I can remember all their ages. We have an almost 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 5-year-old, and twin boys that are almost 4 years old. So, So a house of seven people and five children, we experience, as, as I'm sure many of my, uh, many of the, of the parents listening to this are going to give a hearty amen even from the couch, uh, we experience all kinds of toilet issues in our home. For some reason, our littler kids, not the bigger kids so much, but the littler kids, uh, for some reason they think it's necessary uh, that when they're using the restroom, they need to use like a half a roll of toilet paper. Uh, we'll often find them in the restroom with a big old wad of toilet paper, completely unnecessary a huge waste, and it's certainly not wise during this, you know, great toilet paper struggle of 2020. Now, now, church, because of the massive use of toilet paper from the littler kids, what we've encountered in our home are uh, various toilet issues, as I'm sure you've encountered some yourself. Now, these toilet issues need fixing. We cannot keep moving forward, you know, having the, the toilet flood all the time or experiencing these toilet issues. So, so Sarah and I, my wife, came together, we put our minds together, and we, and we figured out a solution so that we would not keep experiencing these toilet issues. We were looking for a solution that would fix the problem. Now, church, I bring all that up um, kind of because it's a little bit humorous, but really to segue us into the sermon today, that, to remind us of the biggest problem for all of humanity, which we know well. Uh, the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The biggest problem for all of humanity is the problem of sin, the problem of rebellion against God. And what I want us to be reminded of today is that there is only 
only one hope for the problem of sin. There is only one hope for, or or one fix for the problem of rebellion against God, and that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that that, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with, with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So what we're being reminded of today is the gospel is the fix. The gospel is what works. The gospel is effective for the problem that faces humanity. So the main point of this morning's sermon is simply this. If you're taking notes on the bulletin that we sent out, the main point is this. As Jesus hangs on a Roman cross, the sinfulness of man is on full display along with the mercy of our great God. Let me read that again so uh, those who are following along can jot this down. The main point is this. As Jesus hangs on a Roman cross, the sinfulness of man is on full display along with the mercy of our great God. Now, as we dive into this today, there's going to be a little bit of overlap with the sermon that we preached this week or last week and the sermon that we are preaching this week. But we have a text in front of us, so it's our desire uh, to work through it here today. So Matthew 27, 32 through 44, uh, let me read it, and then then we'll pray uh, for God's blessing on our time together, and then we'll, we'll start to dive into this. Matthew 27, verse 32, it says, As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand, on the right, and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the two robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Church, will you bow with me uh, in a word of prayer as we prepare to work through this text? Father, we, uh, we come before you uh, in the name of Jesus. And God, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Although we may be apart during these days, not able to gather, we know that you're, uh, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in all of those who belong to you. And so we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit today, that you'd enlighten us uh, to understand and know and believe and live the truth of the scriptures. Father, we pray that you would encourage us today, that you'd challenge us today, that you'd stir us up by way of reminder today. And Father, we pray ultimately that you alone might be glorified in everything that happens uh, as we work through this text uh, today. God, we love you because you first loved us in sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. We pray all this in his most precious name. Amen. Now, the first thing that I would like to do this morning as we think about the text that's before us, Matthew 27, 32 through 44, is I want to talk a little bit about the humiliation of Jesus. So last week, we touched on some of this in quite a bit of detail, uh, the, the humiliation of Jesus. We read last week of all that the Son of God endured at the hands of sinful humanity. So we mentioned last week that Jesus was scourged, which was essentially being flayed to the bone. He was unjustly condemned condemned to be crucified on a Roman cross. We know that he was mocked, that he was spit upon, that he was taunted, that he was degraded, that Jesus was physically beat. As we read of those events that occurred last week, uh, we know that it's hard for you and I to completely wrap our minds around everything that Jesus endured. For most of us, probably all of us, the, the things that Jesus endured are only the kinds of things that we see in the, in the movies. It's not reality. It's stuff that we see 
uh, when we're watching a, you know, a, a television show or a war movie. But what we need to recognize today is that what we have read about what Jesus, who is God in the flesh, endured, these things actually happened. Like Jesus actually bled on the cross. Jesus actually suffered. Now, again, what makes all that Jesus endured even more shocking for us is, is for us to remember who he is, who it is that is suffering. So we know that there are countless people in history who've endured all kinds of horrific treatment. We know that there have been Christian martyrs in history who have been you know, tied to a stake and, and burned alive. We, we know in graphic detail the, the things that occurred in Nazi Germany. We have the pictures, we have eyewitness accounts, we have people who have, uh, who have experienced difficult things. We also know the horrors of things like abortion and, and slavery. But church, although all of these examples are terrible in their own right, what we need to recognize here today is that there is still nothing that compares to what Jesus, the Son of God, did for sinners. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 52 verse 14 that his appearance as he suffered was marred beyond recognition. I mean, Jesus was beaten to a bloody pulp. Now again, we must realize that, that all of this is more than just physical stuff that happened to somebody. It's about his identity. It's about who he is. Never before in history, nor ever again, will one as prestigious and important as Jesus be treated in this way. And that is because there is no one who is as prestigious as Jesus. There's no one who is like him. Jesus is the King of Kings. Jesus is the Lord of Lords. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the King of righteousness and the King of all glory. Jesus is the creator of all. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that it was by him and through him and for him that all things were created. This is the Jesus that is suffering on the cross. This is the Jesus who is being humiliated before sinful humanity and at the hands of sinful humanity. You see, in our text today, we find even more of the humiliation that Jesus endured. And so what we've read here today from our text is that Jesus was so physically torn apart and so exhausted from being whipped to the bone and being beaten and spat upon that he needed help carrying his cross. And so Matthew records for us that there was a man. There was, uh, there was Simon of Cyrene who was compelled to help Jesus carry the beam of the cross to the place of crucifixion. We know that Jesus was stripped of his clothing. And, and, and many, many theologians, many scholars believe that Jesus, as he hung on the cross, was laid naked for all to see. We know that Jesus was innocent, yet hung to die between two guilty, condemned thieves. The, the one who had only done good in his life, who healed every disease, was being mocked and ridiculed and taunted. His enemies were in a position to feel like they had won as they walked past him and taunted him and said, why don't you go ahead and come down from the cross now? Why don't you go ahead and perform some kind of a miracle? Again, all of this as he hung on a Roman cross, the most humiliating way to, to die. The Bible reminds us in Philippians 2.8 that Jesus was obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. The implication is that it's shocking that God who is flesh would die in the most humiliating way possible. You see, dear church, the shocking thing here is that God would choose to suffer like this. This is what's absolutely shocking about what we're reading. It's not just that somebody suffered, it's who suffered. God in the flesh was suffering in this way for sinners, for the redemption of, of, of broken, rebellious sinners. I've said this before and I'll continue to say it and remind us of this. Jesus did not have to do this. There was not some heavenly council that gathered together and outvoted Jesus. He was saying, no, I don't want to do it. But they said, no, we really think it's a good idea. That's not what happened. His arm wasn't twisted into it. He was not forced to do something against his wishes. No, God became flesh in order to die for sinners because he wanted to. He wanted to do it. I mean, we talk a lot about free will. Like, I have free will and they have free will. Do you realize, dear church, the freest person, the freest being in all of the universe is God. Like, I can be manipulated. I can be tricked. My decisions are influenced by others in my surroundings. Not God. 
He's the freest of all. And he decided to die on the cross for the redemption of sinners of his own free accord. He's not, he was not manipulated into it or forced into it. He did it because he wanted to. Probably the most famous verse of all that many of us know by heart, John 3, 16, makes it abundantly clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. God sent his son Deity in flesh to die on that cross because he loved the world. He loved the broken, the sinner. He wanted to redeem. The humiliation of Jesus at the cross, dear church, was about reconciliation. God wanted to. He didn't have to. He wanted to redeem fallen humanity and reconcile fallen humanity unto himself. And it's this act of divine love, and it's in this act, excuse me, of divine love that God is glorified. He's magnified. God chose to do this because this was the greatest way that he could demonstrate his goodness, his kindness, his love, and his power to save. God has brought glory at the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the truth of the cross is that Jesus was brought low so that you and I who believe might be brought high. Not because of anything that we've done, and we've covered that in sermons past, right? We know that we didn't earn it. We, don't, we, we know that we don't deserve it. We know that we weren't born into it, but he willingly was brought low that those who would believe might be brought high. He was humiliated that we who believe would be blessed in him. I want to read for us out of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Church, did, I know that was a lot there, but did you hear, did you hear it, right? We've been blessed Right? We've been blessed in Christ Jesus because he shed his blood. He was brought low that we might be blessed. Take some time to dwell on that this week. That, that God, who is the creator of the cosmos, lowered himself, took on sinful flesh, came into this darkened, sinful, terrible world that you and I might be reconciled to him. A wonderful and amazing truth that we ought to, uh, that we ought to dwell on. So, so we've seen in our text so far the humiliation of Jesus, that God lowered himself, uh, that, that we might be reconciled to him. But, but in our text, not only do we encounter the humiliation of Jesus, we also encounter, once again, the, the sinfulness of mankind, specifically the arrogance, uh, the pride of mankind. Let's look back in our text. Matthew 27, I want to read verse is 39 through 43. I think we see the arrogance of man on full display here. Starting in verse 39, it says, And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now, again, church, uh, like the humiliation of Jesus, this is something, as we think about the arrogance of mankind, this is something that we have, uh, that we've already kind of hit on in, in, in previous weeks, but we find it uh, coming up in our text once again here. So what we have here is the abuse that the creation hurls onto the creator. So that's what's happening here. We have the creation uh, hurling abuse onto the one who created them. So given the reality of who Jesus has shown himself to be, this is nothing short of pride. In fact, I feel like there, there needs to be even a greater word to describe this. I just can't think of it. But this is, this is 
pride, a perfect example of it here in our text here today. The sinful pride of humanity. Again, I don't mean to rehash a bunch of things that we already know, but, but just think of everything that Jesus has done publicly, right? We, we, we know all this uh, because we've worked, uh, spent many, many months working through the gospel of Matthew. But what did Jesus go about doing? He went about healing disease, and he went about feeding thousands, and raising the dead, and commanding the weather. I want us to know that everyone who's throwing insults on, on to Jesus and, and throwing blows at him. All of them know that Jesus went about doing good. All of them know about his miraculous works. I want you to hear what Matthew said about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 23 through 25. It says, and he, that's Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Now, did you hear what it said there, what Matthew said? Jesus was famous, right? Jesus was healing all who were coming to him, healing every disease, epileptics, uh, paralytics, lepers. Jesus was doing miraculous works. And what I want us to know here, again, is to be reminded of, is that those who were insulting Jesus and throwing blows on him, those who were probably even nailing the nail that held his hand to that cross, knew these things to be true about Jesus. They knew what he had done. They knew what he was known for? You see, what, what we need to know here today is that while God humbled himself and became a man uh, to save and rescue sinners, mankind is due to sin inclined to exalt himself at the, for the sake of self. And church, I, I want you to catch the irony here. This is a striking reversal that is before us here today. But God who deserves every ounce of exaltation, God who deserves every single ounce of glory, and Entered into a sin-filled world, and man, mankind, human beings who deserve nothing, end up exalting themselves as the highest authority, even above that of God. Church, this has been the problem for mankind from Genesis 3 and on into the day that we are living in right now. You think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned when they exalted themselves above the word of God. God gave Adam a command in the garden that you should not eat, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent comes to Eve and twists the words of God and, and, and Adam's just kind of standing by watching the whole thing happen. And what do they end up doing? They think, you know what? We know better than God. They exalt themselves above God's authority. I mean, think about in Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. What did humanity do? They said, you know what? We're going to take matters into our own hands. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to build a tower to the heavens. Man exalting himself above God. Pharaoh in the book of Exodus ignored and defied God even in the face of plagues. King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 took credit and glory, personal glory for everything that belonged to God. We know in Acts chapter 5 that Ananias and Sapphira thought that they could even outwit God and lie to the Holy Spirit. You see, this is the ongoing problem for all of humanity. We tend, left to ourselves, to exalt ourselves. In areas Arrogance and pride, we want to lift ourselves up. up. We don't want to honor God or give thanks to him like Romans chapter 1 says, but instead we refuse to honor God. This is our tendency. Left to ourselves, left to our sinful nature, we will exalt self above the authority of God. Now church, this ought to serve as a very serious warning for you and I here this morning. How easy is it for you and I Those of you who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, how easy is it for you and I to slip into self-exaltation and arrogance? Now, now, because you're at home, you can raise your hand. It's okay. It's only those who, who already know that you struggle with this who are with you this morning. So you can raise your hand and you can say, yeah, it's easy for me to slip into that. Like, that's something we have to fight against. It's too easy for us to kind of start acting in pride and start exalting ourselves and start thinking that we know best. And how easy is it for you and I to give even lip service to God, but not honor him with our hearts? I'm mindful of what Jesus 
Jesus said in the Gospels, and I can't quote it perfectly, but speaking of the Pharisees, what did he say? Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? Now, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Church, if we're not careful, these things can happen to us. We can sit in church when we give, have the opportunity to gather, and we can sing the songs, and we can raise our hands, hands, and we can close our eyes when we pray, and we can look the part while our hearts are far from God, and we are only in the business of exalting ourselves. Let us remember James 4, 6, that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Church, we deserve nothing but, but the wrath of God Almighty because of our sin, and God would be completely justified in giving that. If God were to leave us in the place of, of wrath, because of our sin, God would not be any less good. He wouldn't be any less righteous. He wouldn't be any less holy. But you see, dear church, it's at the cross of Jesus Christ that, what, that we find that God was working because it pleased him to extend mercy to those who would believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus at the cross was brought low that those who are his might be granted grace. Jesus was humiliated on the cross at the, at the hands of arrogant humanity, sinful, prideful, rebellious humanity. God in the flesh was brought low that we might be granted grace. And church, the sign or the fruit of this grace in your life is, is, is seen in the, in the fruit of repentance, the sign of repentance Certainly initial repentance and turning from our sin, doing that 180, but turn from my sin and place faith in Jesus Christ. But then there should be ongoing confession and repentance. Like our lives as Christians should be not like I repented once and confessed once and now I'm good. Our lives should be marked by ongoing confession and repentance. God, you are righteous. God, you are perfect in all of your ways. I'm broken. And I still sin, whether deliberately or accidentally or whatever, I still struggle. So God, forgive me. I confess my sin and I ask that you would forgive me. The, I, I don't have time to read it. Actually, I have all the time in the world because I just have a camera here. But I, I won't read it today. You could read it if you want. First John chapter 1, 5 to 10 kind of kind of makes this, makes this point for us that this ought to be a mark of our lives. I mean, John says in, in 1 John chapter 1, he says that if any of us says that we don't have sin, we're a liar. And the truth of God isn't in us. He says, but if we confess our sins... He's faithful and he's just to forgive. You see, this is the mark of a Christian. This is one of the main marks for a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that we would be living in ongoing repentance. Not, not ongoing condemnation. Don't get that confused. I'm not saying that we walk condemned all, all the time because that would be not believing the cross of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, that there is there, uh, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What I'm saying is we ought to walk in constant recognition of who God is and who we are. So churches, we've reflected on Jesus at the cross. We see his work in the midst of our sin. His work, his humiliation in the midst of humanity's arrogance. I think this is the idea even behind Romans chapter 5 verse 8, right? That Christ died for us while we were sinners. And Jesus didn't look down the corridor of time and say, well, you know what? There's a group of people who kind of got it figured out. I think that I'll go ahead and meet them halfway and help them. It's not what happened. It's so while we were arrogant, while we were rebellious, while we were in our sin, Christ died for us us. Now church, as, as we prepare to close this morning, which shouldn't get you too excited because that probably means at least 15 more minutes, but as we do prepare to close this morning, I'd like for us to think and dwell on two gospel truths that I think are very evident in the text that, are, that is before us here this morning. The first truth I want us to focus on, and we'll do that in just a moment, is just the incredible and indescribable mercy of God. My prayer is that God would remind us of his mercy today. He's a God who is merciful and gracious. The second truth that I want to remind us of is, is the hope of souls no longer damned, but, but, but saved, but given eternal life. You see, church, we know 
The sin in us is the problem, right? That's what we talked about, right? Sin is the problem, and the only fix, the only effective fix for the problem of sin is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And once the gospel has been applied to a guilty sinner, I think something happens, and one of those things is mercy. Like the mercy of God is applied to that person who believes on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a moment and reflect a bit on the mercy of God. So church, the most common definition uh, of mercy is one that we have heard before. The most common definition of mercy that you've heard is, is mercy is not getting what we do in fact deserve. That's mercy. Mercy is not getting what we do in fact deserve. So church, if God's mercy is not applied to our lives, then we are condemned. Right? Because that means we are getting what we do deserve. Right? We deserve nothing but condemnation, death, and divine wrath. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Ephesians chapter 2, we were all by nature children of wrath. Right? So these are things that are true. Now you may be at home on your couch kind of muttering under your breath and thinking, well, Pastor Derek, come on. I mean, that's a little harsh. It's way too harsh. Why don't you just relax a little bit? I mean, just, just calm it down just a tad. And my response to that would be simply this, church, I can't relax on this. And I won't relax on this. You see, we must always keep this in view. If, and I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it, right? If we don't know the depths of our depravity, then we won't know the goodness of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't know and, and understand and believe that we are a needy people, right? Then we won't look to the gospel, the power of God unto salvation for, to give us the, the, the hope and the certainty that we need, You see, church, we need to remember the depths of our depravity. Again, not staying in condemnation, but remembering that he's the creator who is righteous and perfect, and we are the creation who is broken. You see, church, our tendency, I think, is often to begin to think that, you know what, we're pretty good. Right? And this especially happens as we grow in our Christian faith. And I think the more we, we start to think along those lines, the, the less we lean into the truth of the gospel. See, I think it's important for us to always remember our great need for God. Like, may there, may there not be a day or a moment that goes by that you and I don't know Deep in our gut, like we know and we believe for certain, we are so desperately in need of God to remember what we sing very often here as a church family. My sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. You see, church, as we look to the cross of Jesus, we see on full display his mercy, the mercy of God, divine mercy extended. Jesus is suffering and dying in our place that you and I would be forgiven. Jesus is bearing our punishment so that we don't get what we deserve. That's mercy, dear church. This is the nature of God. This is what Jonah realized. Now, I don't have time this morning to go all the way into the story of Jonah, but you probably remember it well. Like Jonah, a prophet of God, who's told to go to Nineveh and tell them that Nineveh is going to be judged for their sin. But Jonah hates Nineveh, and he doesn't want Nineveh to receive mercy. And so he runs away. And God actually, uh, eventually, uh, you know, rescues him from the depths of the ocean. And Jonah finally goes into Nineveh. And he says, you know, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And what does Nineveh do? Nineveh repents. Nineveh repents. And then God extends mercy because that's what God does. And then listen to what Jonah, because Jonah doesn't like this. Jonah doesn't want Nineveh receiving mercy. He doesn't like them. He wants them to be judged. And I love, I, love I, just, I, I just think it's really interesting, I should say, the response of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, just listen. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. That's God's mercy extended to Nineveh. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah ran away because he knew the nature of God, that God is merciful, that God is gracious, that God is abounding in steadfast love, that God relents from disaster. 
That is the character of our God. Now again, church, God's mercy, I think, is realized. Not not I think, I know. God's mercy is realized when one repents and believes the message of the gospel. And this is the only way. There is no other way to be a recipient of, of, of God's mercy which saves. There's no other way. Right? The gospel is the only way. And contrary to what some may say, because some hear that and they get upset. Don't you tell me there's only way. That's, that doesn't even make any kind of sense. Right? There's got to be at least five or six other ways. Right? Some would argue that, but I want to counter that argument by saying, no, no, there is only one way. The gospel is the only way. And that's not bad news. That's good news. That's great news. That's fantastic news. Church, if, if you were sick, if you were sick and on your deathbed, and, and I came to you and I told you, look, there, there is a cure. There is a medicine that will make you well, but there's only one medicine, right? You, you could try all kinds of other stuff, but that's not going to work. It's not going to be effective. You will still die. There's one medicine that will save you. Would you respond to me? Well, that's just ridiculous. There's got to be another way. I'm upset and I'm angry. Of course not. You'd respond to me with gladness and thankfulness and and joy and anticipation of receiving that medicine. You'd say, where is it? I want to receive it. Thank you for this good news. You see, it's good news when Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Now, church, we need to also recognize here today that God's mercy, mercy is directly related to his grace. If mercy is not getting what we do deserve, then once mercy is applied to us, it then ends up leading to us getting what we don't deserve. Let me say that again because it could be a little confusing. Not getting what we do deserve leads to you and I receiving what we, what we don't deserve. And, and that thing that we receive that we don't deserve is salvation. Salvation. Eternal life. See, in our text today, there are, I think, two who received this salvation according to the mercy of God. Uh, the, the first one was Simon, uh, the, the man who helped Jesus carry his, the, the beam of the cross to the place of crucifixion. Uh, Mark 15, 21 seems to indicate that Simon became a follower of Jesus. Perhaps this moment, carrying the cross for Jesus or along with him, impacted him so greatly that he became a follower of Jesus, a believer in the gospel. But the other one that, that received the gift of salvation was the thief, that died next to Jesus. Now, what we need to recognize is that this isn't recorded for us in our text. Remember, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are are inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they are based on eyewitness accounts. And so things that Matthew mentions aren't necessarily things that Luke mentions, or Mark mentions, or John mentions. These are eyewitness accounts, and so there's a tendency to focus on different things. So Matthew doesn't record for us that that one of the thieves that hung next to Jesus cried out for salvation, but Luke does. Luke seems to uh, have recognized this and saw this and under the inspiration of the Spirit thought it necessary to record it. So I want to read it. I want to read it for us in in Luke. Luke uh, chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 verses 39. If I can find it. Luke 23 39 through 43. It says this. One of the criminals who were hanged uh, Uh, who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So the first thing that we have reflected on here at the close of our sermon is the mercy of God. The second thing is the salvation of souls. And here we see a criminal who hung next to Jesus based on the Luke's gospel account. One of these criminals, one of these, these thieves 
pled with Jesus for salvation and it was granted him. So church, I think these two criminals being crucified next to Jesus actually in, in, in a sort of way represent all of humanity, right? Like all of humanity, both of these thieves are sinners. Uh, even the, the, the thief that receives salvation recognizes this. He says, look, we're receiving what is due to us. We're guilty of our sins. So they are both sinners. They are both guilty before God, much like you and I. Every human being on the face of the planet is guilty before God. We are all sinners. Now, one of the criminals refuses to repent and believe in Jesus. There are some, in fact, many in our world who do this today. Right? You offer them the gospel, they refuse to believe. I'm not going to believe. I want to do what I want to do. But the other criminal, in humility, acknowledges his sin and believes that Jesus is who he says he is. Now, some do this uh, to, to the praise of, of God's glorious grace. Some do this. And as a result, this one, uh, one of the criminals is condemned and the other is saved. You see, for one, the one who repented and believed, the gospel worked. Right, for the thief that cried out to Jesus, the gospel worked. The gospel was effective. No, no longer was he condemned in his sin, but he's forgiven and he's made new and he's promised eternal life. You see, this helps us to focus on the, the, the grace of our God. Right? The grace of our God is that we've received eternal life even though we don't deserve it. So church, as we close this morning, uh, let me just ask you... Just maybe a kind of a general question, but what have you done with the gospel? I mean, what have you done with the truth of the gospel? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. What have you done with that? Have you, have you rejected it? Have you chosen not, like, I just don't want to believe? Have you only understood intellectually but not really had faith? Or have you believed the message and been forgiven of your sins. See, my hope today is that many, many, many of you who are listening today have believed the message of the gospel and are saved, have been granted eternal life, a, a, a life that will, that will remain, right? That, that it will not be, you will not be snatched out of his hand. It's yours because God has given it to you. And if that's you today, my prayer is that the gospel would not just be the power of God unto salvation, but it would also be the power of God by which godly living, all godly living, flows for you. That we would be a people who, yes, trust the gospel for the salvation of our soul, but we then let the gospel transform our very lives. Let us be a people who believe the gospel and then live the gospel in the way that we relate with one another. Right? That we forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. Right? That's letting the gospel transform the way I relate with one another. I'm no longer walking in bitterness or unforgiveness or anger. I'm forgiving as God in Christ forgave me. Letting the gospel impact our marriage. Right? For husbands, we what? Love our wives. Not how we see fit, but as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. It's so letting the gospel transform the way my life functions, the way I operate in my life. Letting the gospel uh, transform the way I handle my resources. Right? No longer am I hoarding and taking and building my kingdom, but instead, as God has been generous to me in Christ, so I am generous with others. I pray that we would be a people who not only believe the gospel, but we live the gospel but maybe you're listening today to this, to this message and you're one who has not believed the message. You, you haven't believed that Jesus is who he says he is and that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Well, I just want to plead with you today. I want to plead with you to believe and be saved. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. I pray right now that the Lord might be pleased to, to, to grant you the gift of faith, to enlighten your eyes, to draw you unto himself that you would believe. Today very well could be the day of salvation for you. You see, in the, in the strange times that we find ourselves in, I want us to remember today that our hope, our hope is in our God and his work in the gospel. 
I want us to remember the certain hope that we have in the gospel. While everything around us may be crumbling or uncertain or, or falling apart, right? It's, it's the gospel that we have. The gospel gives us hope. If my bank account is drained, if, if I lose my home, if I'm struck with a sickness, whatever, the gospel is my hope. I want us to remember today that it's on Christ, the solid rock, which we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so this week, remember the hope of the gospel, the certain hope of the gospel. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I want you to remember, especially in this time of social distancing, I want you to remember For those of you who believe the gospel, that God is never distant from his children, right? We might be doing this social distancing thing, but God doesn't do that. Romans chapter 8, right? I am convinced that nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying that we might not be disciplined for a time, Right? I'm not saying that, uh, that, that you know, we're, we're always going to feel God's presence. I'm just telling you what he promises. He promises to never leave us, to never forsake us. He promises to be close. Nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so again, dear church, my prayer today is that we would remember that the gospel is our only hope. The humiliation of Jesus at the cross in the midst of sinful, arrogant humanity is what, is, is, is what produced in, 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 in our lives practically, right? The mercy of God extended to us and the salvation of our soul. May we remember the hope that is ours in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this sermon will encourage you, challenge you, will convict you that the Spirit of God would use it as he sees fit in our very lives. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer as we wrap this up? Father, once again, we thank you so much for your goodness towards us in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you might grant us a hope, that you might encourage our hearts, that you might fill us with your spirit. Lord, there may, may be many who are watching today who are struggling, who feel like maybe there is no hope. Things are crumbling around them. They don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Maybe they're without a job. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of the hope of the gospel. That we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, we who were by nature of children of wrath, have been saved according to your divine grace, divine mercy, not by any work of ourselves, but all of you. God, may we cling to the gospel. May we look to Jesus. May we fix our eyes on him. And Lord, I pray that you would be stirring that in our hearts this week. You'd stir us up by way of reminder. God, we need it. God, I confess I'm prone to forget. So I pray you'd remind me often of your goodness in the gospel. Remind all of us often of your goodness in the gospel. May we believe. And if there's anybody who's listening here who has not believed, oh Lord, I pray they would. God, I pray that you might use the days we are living in to spark a mighty, mighty revival. That there will be many who fall on their faces and repent of their sin and turn to Jesus Christ and turn to the gospel for the forgiveness of their sins and reconciliation with God. Fill us with joy this week, we ask. We love you, Lord, only because you first loved us. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen. I pray that you will be blessed in Jesus as you listen to this message.